Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Nigeria. My name is Ajibola Amzat. I'm the editor at the International Center for Investigative Reporting, Abuja. And uh, with me is uh, Professor Oyewale Tomori. Uh, Professor Tomori is a Nigerian professor of biology, uh, born in a leisure house state about 75 years ago. He received a doctor of veterinary medicine from Amadou Bello University, Zaria, and doctorate degree in biology from the University of Ibadan in Oyo State. And that was the place where he was appointed professor of biology in 1981. That same year, the Otomori received the United States Department of Health and Human Service Public Health Service Certificate for contribution to Lassa fever research. His research interest focuses on viral infection, including Ebola, hemorrhagic fever, yellow fever, and Lassa fever. He served as the regional virologist for the World Health Organization African region between 1994 and 2004, and was later appointed as a pioneer vice chancellor of Redeemers University, Ogun State, Nigeria. Dr. Tomori is the chair National Lassa Fever Committee and currently is the chairman of BioVaccine Board, the company commissioned by the Nigerian government for local productions of vaccine. He's also board member of the Global Alliance for Vaccine Immunization, Gavi. Prof, you are welcome to the International Center for Investigation Reporting interview this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for accepting to be part of uh, this uh, short conversation. I'm going to first of all ask you, Prof, a Nigerian figure shows over 141,000 cases of infection and 1,694 deaths and 1,116 cases of recoveries. Do you think that this is a realistic picture of the COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria? Um, thank you very much. Just one slight correction. I was a member of the Gabi board. I'm no longer a member, but oh. that's, uh, yeah, but that's okay. I think I need to correct that in my CV. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Yeah. The, the issue with the um, COVID situation in Nigeria, uh, whatever figures you get is based on how good your testing is. Uh, wh what we get as a number of cases is only those ones that we tested. And you know the disease being what it is, uh, that like a tip, a tip of the of the iceberg, because there are, you know, uh, 40, 50, 60 percent of the people uh, have the disease, but they are not showing any symptoms. So if they are not showing any symptoms, then people are not testing them. So what you're getting is actually just a small number of those we tested. And if your testing is not up to par, then you only get a, a little bit of what you actually have. So what I'm saying is that. The number of cases in Nigeria, that's the official number based on laboratory tests. The actual number of cases will be much, much, much more than that. There's no chance we can ever know that except test is done. Yes, exactly. That's, you, you got the point. Uh, without your testing and effective testing, uh, testing is not even just that. It's also important. To not test long testing. ago. Yes, go ahead. Hmm. Not long ago, you were, you were quoted as saying that uh, vaccine, we actually not uh, solve the COVID problem in Nigeria. What, what do you mean? Yeah, actually vaccines, well, let me put it this way. Given the current epidemic we have, vaccine is only an addition to the ammunition we have against COVID. Um, people get sick and they are treated in the hospital, they recover. That's another, another way of solving the problem. But the most important thing is prevention. I mean, if you don't get it, then you don't have sick people. And uh, the, the non-pharmaceutical intervention they are put is the surest way of preventing the spread of the disease. I really make a point. You know, we talk about mobile phone. Your mm -hmm. phone is not mobile without you. The way you put it, that's where it is. So it really is a wrong thing to call it a mobile phone because you are the one that make it mobile. So also with this virus. The virus, wherever it is, that's where it stays. But you and I, when we transmit it to other people, make the virus mobile. And so, you know, there's those known 
uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions are the surest way to ensure that uh, you know people don't get the disease and you're not spreading it. But vaccine comes in as an additional, uh, just like the drugs to treat somebody who is sick. But vaccines will be even if you get infected, you you don't get the disease. So that's why I said it's an additional ammunition rather than be a cure all. Uh, because if we get the vaccine, it's not the vaccine that protects you; it's the vaccination mm -hmm. that protects you. Mm -hmm. So if you are not vaccinated, then of course you, you, you vaccine is of no use to you either. But when you, the fact that you are vaccinated does not mean also that you will develop immunity because people react differently with different things. Also, the level of immunity you develop also depends on your state of health. So there are a lot of uh, parameters in between, factors in between, which make vaccine not to be what it is. You remember they talk about efficacy of 90 mm. percent or 60%. Uh, these are some of the problems we're talking about vaccines, but it's a sure way of further preventing the, the spread of the disease. <clears throat> and talking about the vaccine, you know, uh, coronavirus is like a moving target. So when you see the new variants of coronavirus appearing in places like UK and South Africa and all the places I don't know now, will the vaccine being produced also protect people from the new variants of the virus? Yes, let me make one statement from the beginning. It is the natural way of viruses to, to mutate and produce variants. It is their way of overcoming your body's resistance. I mean, if you, if the virus, the more we transmit the virus, the more the variations we get. Mm -hmm. I mean, the one that is in me, if it doesn't leave me, cannot mutate to any other thing. But when it goes to another person, then it can also, supposing the level of immunity in that person is slightly better than my own. The virus adapts to that and becomes a new variant. <clears throat> so that's what happens when you have variation. It is a natural phenomenon of viruses to mutate, but a lot of the mutation is, is of no consequence. But then some of them happens in which it increases the property, changes the property of the virus, like it can increase its ability to transmit faster than what it used to do, or it can increase its ability to even cause a more severe infection. So all these are factors that come with, with immunity. Now to the question about whether vaccines are, majority of the, of the for other viruses, majority of the vaccines that are produced are, are basic and they, they, they protect against uh, mutations. But we're seeing in the current situation that it's not like that. I mean, we've had results result that so the Oxford, the AstraZeneca does not pr protect against some strain like in, or let me just say it does not protect. It, it, it is less protective, you know, against the South African state, for example. But then even that study, one has to also take it with a pinch of salt. They've only tested about 2,000 people and they limited it to a particular uh, uh, age group, which is an age group that is not really known to have the infection. So the fact that, you know, they didn't develop immunity does not mean they are not protected. So these are some of the factors here, yes. Uh, and to be, to, be, to, be, to, be, to uh, uh, congratulate, or let me not say, to, to show that the team, the AstraZeneca group is very, is up to date. They're actually now trying to produce a virus, I mean, a vaccine against this uh, South African strain. So mm -hmm. as, uh, the, the way to catch up with viruses is to be ahead of the viruses, or as soon as all those changes come, you actually act upon them. I'm going to talking about, about uh, mutation, I mean, uh, genetic sequencing, how that helps in, in, in making you as close to the virus as possible. And again, Prof, I mean, talking about this vaccine, I know that there are vaccines for many diseases now, uh, vaccines for measles, vaccines for polio, for influenza, and all that. Now we have vaccine for COVID. A number of them are coming out now. Hospitals give all sorts of vaccines to children now, you know, and I'm wondering, do this vaccine have a way of affecting the genetics of humans? Maybe in the future, is that possible? So far, the vaccines that are produced do not go into the DNA of the cell. It is when something goes to the DNA that can affect your genetic composition. Mm. Most of the vaccines end up in the what they call the cytoplasm. And there, the, it, will, it will multiply uh, and then be released into the body. It is that release of the proteins that get the body, that the body reacts against and forms antibodies. 
so far, non, I'm not too sure there's any virus now or vaccine that produced that actually goes to attack the DNA. Most stop in the cytoplasm. And so uh, with the information that we have is that it does not alter your genetic uh, composition because it does not get into the DNA, only stays in the cytoplasm. Thank you very much. And not long ago, you and I were talking about the meeting that you just had. You are the chairman of the bio vaccine, uh, uh, the, the company hold by Nigerian government and uh, Mayor and Baker in Nigeria. And I'm wondering, uh, this company has been in existence since 2005, if I'm correct. I, yes. I, I would like to know, for an organization like uh, BioVaccine, what, what have you been doing for in the last uh, 20 years or so to prepare for this kind of period? Have you produced any of your own vaccine? Or are you on the way of producing any? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yes, on record, we, it was started in 2005. But you know, Nigeria, we have to take it in the context of the politics of Nigeria. That the first time Baobasin came around was in 2005. That was the time of uh, Professor Lambo as the Minister of Health. But you know, we had a change of government in 2007 when I think it was Yaradua that came in. Yaradua, yes. Yeah, and you know the normal system of our government, when a new government comes in, all boards, irrespective of whatever it is, are dissolved. And that truncated the life of bow vaccine. To, it was only existing for two years, in 2007, when it was dissolved. And that was a wrong dissolution. I, I actually confronted the minister then, the new minister, I think Professor, the late Professor Shotime. I confronted him and said, it was illegal for the government to dissolve that board. Why? The board of, it's a joint board of both a private and public uh, something. The federal government has only three members. It's actually the minority shareholder. Mm. And it's only in Nigeria that the minority dissolves the majority. You know, uh, you remember the time we had the uh, 19 state governors and 17? Uh, yeah. It's nothing new to Nigeria to do the illegal thing. So that board was dissolved in 19, in 2007, illegally. And unfortunately, each other minister that came in, nothing happened. So the rebirth of, of uh, bio vaccine is actually 2017. So for, 30, for about 10 years after that first dissolution, nothing happened in this country. So if you really want to take the life of bio vaccine, you have to start from 2017, which was when this new body was formed. And within that time, the last three years, uh, a few things have been done. But again, also, uh, the, the nature of doing business in Nigeria, the nature of government has actually stalled. We will have gone much faster than what we're doing. Now, let me give one or two examples. For example, uh, when, the back, when the company was formed, Nigeria had an agreement with Gavi that by 19, uh, 2021, Nigeria will, st will stop uh, support from Gavi and Nigeria will be buying his own vaccine. The business plan was based on that. That come 2021, we should be in a position to procure vaccines for Nigeria or produce some of it. So it's not every vaccine we can produce. So some you'll have to get a partner that will supply you and some you produce yourself. But then if you remember, in 19, uh, the, that was 2021 or just before 2021, Nigeria renegotiated this agreement with Gavi and extended the period of 2021 to 2028, which meant Nigeria will still be dependent on Gavi for another seven, eight years. And if your business plan was based on the fact that the country was going to be uh, purchasing its own vaccine in, 19, in 2021, and now he it says it's going to be purchasing it in 2028, I mean, what, what kind of business is that? And that was the situation that we got into. But in spite of that, it is not that totally in 2028 is when it stops. It is that gradually, step by step, by maybe at 2025 or 2026 or 20 to whatever, uh, some of the vaccines, not all of it, will be supplied by Gavi. So gradually, mm -hmm. we, Gavi will release his fingers from supplying vaccines to Nigeria. And so we now have to base our business plan on that plan rather than on, on the assumption that in 2020, from 2021 on, Nigeria will be purchasing all our vaccines. 
So I mean, mm. if you're doing I mean, so you can imagine being business like that. So when people say bio vaccine has not done anything, it is not because bio vaccine does not want to do anything. It is because we have a government that seems to be inconsistent in the policies that we get. Yeah, does that mean nobody called the attention of any of the administration between 2007 to 2017 to the the necessity of having uh, an organization like bio vaccine? It, it wasn't that we did. I mean, we didn't we didn't stop talking, but you know, each government with its own style, each government with its own priority, and that's what 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 let me just say almost killed the bio vaccine. So it took a new minister. I think it was uh, Professor. Uh, Isaac Adewoli, who had the president, I mean, enough is enough. We should get this thing done. But ministers in between, after the Lambo and subsequent ministers, didn't think it was of importance. So that's why we were, it's not that we weren't talking. We we're making all the noise, getting all the contacts. But if the minister who is in charge says it's not particularly of importance. So it took the convincing uh, Professor Adewoli, who then took it before the executive council and got it approved for. For us to start in 2017. So, what, what, what's the chance of Nigerians having their own vaccine now? Because I understand that there are about 171 vaccine on trial. I mean, in, in, in different stage of a trial now. Apart from the three that's already, you know, in the market, does Nigeria mm -hmm. have have any chance of uh, producing its own vaccine at all? Sure, you have. I mean, if you are focusing on COVID vaccine, no. The obje initial objective is that Nigeria will be producing some of its vaccines locally. That still has not changed. We are only being diverted by COVID at, the, at this particular moment. COVID will go away. The other disease will still remain. Measles will still be with us. Polio, well, luckily we are out of polio now. But there are other diseases, pertussis, uh, whooping cough, uh, measles, you know, cerebrospinal meningitis, they will still remain with us. And therefore, local production of some of those vaccines, yellow fever, for example, would be what would be the focus of, of uh, the bowel vaccines. For right now, I think it would be, it would not be wise to say that bowel vaccine will get involved in COVID vaccine production. Uh, I think we'd be deceiving ourselves. And if we let people believe that, that's not the truth. Because first, we are, we are, we are just starting. Uh, the hope, we don't know how long COVID will stay. Uh, if it is something that is wiped out in the next one or two years, of course, then uh, it doesn't make sense for us to get involved in even the whole construction of the vaccine, I mean, of the facilities. We take anything between two to three years. So if COVID is still around uh, longer than we thought, we may participate in the tail end of COVID vaccine production, like is, if we have a partner that is involved in COVID-19 vaccine production, and we are partnering with such a company, they may actually produce the bulk over there, and then we complete the cap and, what they call cap and filling in our local production at home. That's if COVID remains forever. I mean, well, not forever, for it's still a longer time to come. But then let's not forget that the reason for setting up bio vaccine in 2017 was not because of COVID because there was no COVID then. So mm. those other things still remain. Your measles, your, uh, your yellow fever, your you know, uh, BCG, all those kind of things, they still remain. So we still have the focus. The main thing is still behind us. I think COVID is just a diversion now. And I'm sure it will soon go away. So we must not forget the basic reason why Balfazin was, was established. In one of your interviews, you, you, you said that Nigerian is, too much into collaboration with many partners that we need to do something of our own at some point. Uh, don't you think that seeking vaccine for COVID X where it's a way of exhibiting our own over dependence on others? Well, let, let's not uh, deceive ourselves. I mean, sometimes it's good to tell ourselves the truth. I have a problem with many of my colleagues who work with the government and paint a picture so rosy that you know, it is not the reality. The reality with us is that over this issue of vaccine production, I've been, I've been on one or two, I mean, of uh, acquiring uh, COVID vaccine. I've been on one or two different, and I, I'm of the opinion that what Nigeria needed was just one committee, not multiple committees, one committee that takes in all the information from all of the different vaccine producers so that we can compare and contrast. 
are distinct from one, uh, one group for Sputnik, another group for uh, Moderna, uh, one other one for whatever the different kind of Chinese vaccine, uh, all sorts of things. That way you cannot really come in and compare. So if we have just got one committee that is looking at, at this issue, then our discussion will have been much, more reduced. And we have actually gone into action. Remember those countries that are having vaccines now, they paid for some of these things. They took a gamble. They are not sure what the outcome will be. They took a gamble way back in July, August. They paid for this vaccine even without knowing whether it was going to come up. That gamble, that courage, that decision to this thing, we lack that in Nigeria. We will talk and talk and talk until we are in, the, in a state of confusion at the end of it all, and now rush to this thing. Recently, you heard about the newspaper no, uh, the reports that Nigeria was disqualified from something. That was a big decision, but that's not true. It wasn't that we were disqualified. Let me put it this way. We disqualified ourselves by not meeting the criteria set for you to get the vaccine. If you remember when WHO set up their committee, they decided that they're going to look at the case fatality rate. They're going to look at the uh, infection per million of people or whatever, the rate infection. And they're going to look at your, your preparedness and having the facilities to store the vaccine. Remember, we have different kinds of vaccines. Some we have to start at minus 70 degrees, some at ordinary room, uh, ordinary two degrees uh, refrigerator. Now, the first vaccine they were trying to give to us was the Pfizer, which had to be kept at minus 70. It mm -hmm. took all of Nigeria to go and, I mean, you remember the MPCD came up and said they were pushing out the structure at Abuja, we can run at minus 85, and they had the capacity for 100,000. But then, if you're going to depend on that, why create additional problem for yourself? Mm. You know, when there are alternative vaccines that don't require that kind of thing. And what's the guarantee anyway that uh, over a long period of time with the poor electricity supply in the country, that we can actually maintain those things. Yet, in, in, because of the experience we have with polio, virtually every local government you know, has a, a cold store at two degrees, four degrees, which can take any of the other vaccines. So why mm. go for uh, 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 Pfizer when there are alternatives? These are part of the discussion I'm talking about. Long time ago, we would have made up our mind, Pfizer is not meant for us. This is the one we have because of our level of development. And then focus on that and put all our money into it and go and buy those ones. So which, which one do you say are good for Nigeria at the moment? At the moment, the Oxford, the AstraZeneca uh, can be stored at uh, you know, ordinary free temperature. There are some that the, the Russian, I mean, the Sputnik 5, uh, the Chinese have made some. Uh, so there are quite at least six, seven, eight other, or other vaccines that can be kept at what we have facilities for. I would rather go for this one. The Indians are making another one. So this is why I thought the committee should have sat down together and uh, look at each of these and find out which suits our condition better without having for us to make additional uh, uh, preparation for. I mean, right now, we are, it's not likely we're ever going to get the Pfizer, you know, in the mm -hmm. future. Now we have built a minus 85 degrees uh, something. What are you going to keep there? So these are some of the things I talk about, lack of combination, coordination, and planning in Nigeria. And what it happens with very aspect of our life. So it's not just with health alone. You, you know what we're, what we're dealing with. Take the issue of the time when suddenly one arm of the government decided that they're going to Everybody was going to register for NI, NIM or in the national mm -hmm. identification. Some see the confusion it caused. Is it the time we should be doing that one? Or if we have to do it, couldn't they have done it a better way? And these are different arms of government doing what they like at different times without considering what is happening in the country. So that's the that national disorderliness is something we need to address. Uh, with the experience we've had with this COVID-19 and the efforts to fight COVID-19 in different countries of the world, do you think Nigeria or our government has learned any lesson from this experience at all? To say, if it happens that, God forbid, any virus or cause rose again, are we prepared to engage? You know, we won't know that until that thing comes. Uh, you can prepare for something. It is when the exam comes. As a student, you, you think you have read well, and then you go for the exam and you fail. 
you know. Have you learned I mean, any lesson at all from all these failures of the previous years? I, I want to I want to say yes, but I, I won't say yes. I used to say one thing about Nigeria. We we operate on lessons forgotten. Mm. Which I think is a sad thing to say about our country. I, I'll give one or two examples. Take the issue of Lassa fever, for example. It's been with us for the last 50 something years. But each time Lassa fever comes annually, it's like something new has come. And yet we know that it has been coming occurring in this country. In, in fact, since the last three or four years, the number of cases every year have been much more than the year before. Yet when Lassa comes in October, November, it's like, oh, something new has come. You know, so I, in that light, I don't think we have learned a lesson. Take the issue of the Ebola. For once, maybe that was a star in our, in our armor when over a period of time, we, we were able to take care of Ebola. But I think what happened was that Ebola was appeared to be a more vicious virus than this one. And everybody is it, it, scared the daylight out of all of us from government <laughs> to individuals. So we came out and did something about that. But as soon as that was finished, what did we do? We disbanded all of the structures that we use in preventing Ebola. And then, so now this is coming. And then we actually were not prepared. And what I mean by we're not prepared, the NCDC had only two labs at the time when, when COVID came. And they had to start building laboratory during the epidemic. Mm -hmm. And this is a country that has been independent for 60 years. Should we be talking about laboratories at this stage? And so NCDC was now making ammunition at the war front. And that's the problem. That's why I, I don't think we, we actually learn lessons. Or when the lessons we learn it all for a time and they immediately forget it. Maybe because we're overwhelmed by so many other problems that mm -hmm. you know we are not able to retain that the, the, the lessons of the past. In, the things we do. And one could say that we're really lucky in this part of the world because a lot of uh, people have been predicting that uh, COVID would have wiped out a very large number of uh, people in Africa. I remember Bill Gates predicted a meltdown in, 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 even in Nigeria because of the disease, but that has not happened in, in, in spite of all the poor health uh, care facilities and poor responses of, of the government. What do you think explain this luck that we let, have? Yeah, tell me, let me start by saying that the early predictions were based on ignorance. What do I mean mm. by that? This was a disease that was evolving. Nobody knew anything about it. We didn't know the epidemiology of it. So, but then they are they are based their prediction on history. Africa is the fertile ground for epidemics. And when it comes, it's devastating. It kills everybody in Africa. If at that time COVID was killing people in Europe where they have good health system, so it can it's a matter of extrapolation. You can imagine what will happen in Africa. But then the virus put us to shame and destroyed the history by not behaving as it was behaving. So what I see that what has happened, two things. We're lucky that the virus it is not what we have done in Africa. It is what the virus did not do. And mm. that's what it is. And there are, these were speculations where it could be. One was the fact that could our weather have had any effect on it? You notice during the winter, because of the nature of, of the virus, the way it is spread, the more people congregate together, the, the more the chances of, of, of spreading the disease. In our environment, where our temperature is almost at 30 something degrees all the time, and when we live in the open, our markets are not supermarkets. They're not air conditioned supermarkets. They're right there in the open. Mm -hmm. And that, again, could be one factor that has not been, and you know, uh, experience has shown that up to a certain point at different temperatures, the virus could stay longer, the cooler the temperature. And depending on where it is landing, on the dust, on the dusty place, it's not going to last for too long. So that, that's, that's one factor. There's also the issue that the fact that perhaps coronaviruses have existed in well all over the world, but maybe the one that existed here has given us some measure of immunity, and therefore we are not reacting to 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 it the way they are doing. But studies have now been done to go what you call archival serum. You take serum from people, or you collect your serum that have been in, in your store or before COVID came, and then you check them against antibodies to Ebola. I mean, sorry to uh, COVID, and then see whether there's any major difference between samples collected before COVID came and samples collected now. So that way you can also answer that question. There's also the fact that if you look at the people that were dying in, in Europe, the more of the elderly people, 
you know, with, with uh, what you call comorbidities, diabetes, mm -hmm. hypertension, all those kind of things. Well, the ones that are mainly affected, people in old people's homes and all those kind of people. But then look at the population spread in Africa. A pyramid is very strong at the base because we have much younger people, you know, up to the age of about 25, 40, you know, in that a big bracket of 45% or more of our distance. While overseas, it is the older people that are there. So the, when it is affects the older people, uh, it affects them more and they died more. So they had more, 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 more uh, people dying at, at that age group. But then even if you look at our own uh, parameters, uh, when you look at our epidemiology, yes, people the age of say 50 below, you know, were more affected, but people above 50, more were dying, which mm. contrasts very well with what happens in other parts of the world, except that the base of our population is a major factor in the time. So there are a lot of young people who are not symptomatic, who are asymptomatic, they say, they are not showing any symptoms, but they are still transmitting the disease and carrying it around, but they don't come down with the sickness. And remember, we're only testing those who are sick. So mm -hmm. there are literally hundreds of people, young people who are carrying the damn thing around and who are, who are, who are infecting other people. And that's why those non-intervention, uh, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, you know, become very, very important because majority of the people who are not, they are not showing any symptoms, but they are transmitting the disease. Therefore, if I put on my mask and you put on your mask, then at least we can limit the spread of the disease. So the disease is probably spreading amongst our people, but we're not seeing the, we're not seeing sick people. But not that we're not seeing people who are infected. Antibody survey will be something that will end up tell us how many, how much of our people are actually infected. So as a matter of fact, if your immune system is very, very strong enough, it is possible that you could carry this virus for as long as possible and you would not even know about it. No, not like that. The, 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 well, I will, I will quote, it is non specific immunity. Let me put it this way. You mentioned, we mentioned that the older people, because of other conditions like uh, diabetes, hypertension, their, their body's resistance is much lower than a healthy people who has no, no, uh, no mobility or that. Or that. So, it's a combination of specific immunity and non-specific immunity. And by specific yes. immunity, and we say immunity that is specifically targeted towards COVID, as distinct from, you know, good nutrition, your body, your health situation is in good place. Uh, you have, you're eating things that are boosting your immunity. Actually, the, the immunity is based on the kind of cells, certain cells in the body. So your nutrition, your age, and all these things could actually have more of those cells. So what we are getting is a situation is that, you know, the, the younger people who are healthier, who have no other problems around them, have this kind of immunity, both basic and uh, specific and non-specific. So when they get infected, the virus will multiply briefly, but then the body's system will mop it out, and therefore you don't get it. But in the process, they do develop specific immunity in that infection mm. so that's what happens you know so prop what are you going to say about those nigerians who still believe that this vaccine is actually designed to depopulate africans to me i would say let's go back in history i mean your child your children must have gotten a lot of vaccines many right. of us have received yellow fever vaccine i have received so many other vaccines if they are only to depopulate us, wouldn't they have used those ones to do it? We are not producing any of them. We see import all those ones from there. So why would they be the COVID they use in depopulating us? So sometimes when stories come, I will ask the people, where is the source of that infection? If you remember there was one time, one of our senators came up with some stories saying that uh, some scientists have, when somebody tells you some scientists and they don't tell you who the scientists are, you want to be very suspicious. When somebody who has no clue about what he's talking about, a senator who did geography and is now talking about immunology, I, I want to look at such a person and say, why would I want to believe? If a carpenter comes to me and says he wants to repair my car for me, will I listen to him? So when people hear stories, find out who is saying it. What, what, uh, a, a lot of these, uh, all of the, a lot of the stories that come about this thing, when you have a religious pastor talking about 5G 
and emotion and all that kind of thing. You want, you want to believe such a pastor? So we should ask who is telling the story. That's number one. Now, normally, it doesn't even make sense. Somebody says, oh, it's 5G that is causing this thing. In my mother's village, there's no 5G. In Nigeria, there's no 5G, and people are getting the infection. So why do you relate the fact that we don't have 5G, we're getting infection? And then, in you know, other part, they say they have 5G, and also getting infection. Does that mean, it means that 5G has nothing to do with it? So these are ways to, people should reason, you know, when they tell you stories. I mean, when, when, when they tell you stories, find out. And rather than spread it without even thinking, you know, the thing is to say, ah, could this story be true? Could this story be true? Before, you know, go on and start spreading such a story. So, Prof, talking about the, the economics of uh, COVID production and all that, I read not long ago that the amount the Europe is spending to procure their uh, in, uh, vaccine is pretty less than what African countries, for instance, I know of South Africa, I, I, I saw some figures and it was quite uh, uh, different. And I'm wondering what you make of that, that Africa would need to even pay more for COVID, I mean, for vaccine than developed countries of the world. Yeah, I mean, I'm not much of an economist, but I think I read something about economic of scale or scale of economy. I don't know how they say it. The more you buy, the less you pay, isn't it? If you are buying in bulk, as compared to you are buying in singles, which, I mean, it was, what, are, what are Africans buying? How much, I mean, take uh, Canada. Canada bought five times the doses of its people need. UK is building up another three times what their people need. Um, EU has bought twice what they need. America, I don't remember how many they have bought over there this year. How much is Nigeria buying? Or how much have we even paid for now? For our 200 million people. We're jumping at 100,000 doses, you know, which is even coming for free. So why are you complaining about the cost? Because it's, if we are planned ahead of time, like others, it's taking a gamble. I mean, sometimes you have to take a gamble. We know we have 140 million people in Nigeria. And we have made up our mind that we're going to vaccinate, I mean, sorry, 200 million people in Nigeria. And we say we want to vaccinate 70%. And we put our mouth, our money where our mouth is. If Nigeria had gone back way back in Jan, uh, August, September, and say we are committed to buying X number of vaccines to vaccinate 140 million people, the price we'll get will be much, much lower than what we're getting, almost com competing with the EU and the Euro. But when today you are, we are, first of all, waiting for donations before you decide what you're going to buy. South Africa, but only 1.2 million, isn't it? Compared to what the other countries are buying. So if you are going to buy it from the same company, the company will sell it for you at that, at the rate, uh, at the, what you call retail rate, than bulk rate. So we shouldn't be complaining about this. We, the question you will be asking ourselves is, why, why did we get to ourselves to this level? A country that took a gamble way back in, in August, when the vaccine was not there, will get a better reach than you who are waiting when nobody is ready to, I mean, when they don't even have the ability to supply the, those they are promised. And then you're coming and last minute and say, please give me one drop. Yeah, they will charge you. Okay, bro, looking at the history of other viral diseases and how they have affected different parts of the world in, in, in the last hundred years, what is your prediction? When do you think that we might be out of the wood for of of, of this uh, pandemic, COVID nineteen. I would be a foolish man to make any prediction <laughs> because this is a virus that is constantly evolving. You remember when this this problem started? It was just a cough and that are runny nose and all that. Today, what is it? It has come with all sorts of things now: loss of smell, uh, loss of taste, uh, all those kind of things. So this is a, a virus that is evolving. And in fact, now you remember the issue of the mutants and the variants that are coming up in South Africa and Europe. I don't know what ways will come up in other parts of the world. So nobody, none of us can predict. We can only speculate and say, if we do this, if we do that, if we do this, then maybe in the, so you remember the modelers, when they model, you know, there was a time when they said 190,000 people uh, would die in Africa and all these kind of things. 
mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what they are modeling, they say there are five things. If you don't do any of these five things, 190,000 will die. Mm. But if you do one, two, the number will go down. If you do all the five, the number will go down. I think I see that as even a way of to, to, less, le, to learn a lesson. If they tell me that if I do one, two, three, four, five things, I'm not going to, but if I don't do them, I'm going to get 100,000 people dying. Isn't that a lesson for me to say, okay, let me do the one I can do to lessen the number. So we can predict what is happening. This is a virus that seems to be smarter than, even smarter than us, the way it's behaving right now. <laughs> and coming up variants and things of that nature. But again, we make the virus what it is. And what do I mean by that? Without the virus being transmitted from one person to another, variations cannot come. Mm. If the virus has been stopped in Wuhan, you know, and didn't get out, we won't be talking about COVID now. But mm. because of the failure to stop it in Wuhan, and then got to other parts of the world, and the failure to stop it in other parts of the world that is leading us to what this is, I'm sure there's one other thing you may be asking me. Oh, this vaccine was produced too fast, and all that kind of thing. Vaccines are normally produced uh, in 20 years, and all that kind of thing. Yes, that's correct. But then I will also give the allusion. When uh, Awolo went to Britain on MV Oreo, it took him I mean, maybe two weeks. When my president now wants to go to Britain, it takes him four hours. Am I going to say because of the speed of his getting there in four hours, I will go by the ship that uh, I will always use? No, advances are being made. The things we used to do in those days, they are not doing it because people are learning more and beginning to, 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 shoot, to, to see things. My generation studied the uh, multiplication with the, at the back of the 2B exercise book, one times one to 12 times 12. If you ask me what is 13 times 12, I don't know. Because all I crammed up was one times one to two. <laughs> yeah. But if you tell my child now, your grandchild now, and say 344 times 10 or something, what does it do? He presses the body. And before you even start carrying one from two to three, he has given you the result. That's the way the world. Would you want that your child to go back to the time table? No. And also, the, the issue about the vaccine, the, the, the building blocks for vaccine have, is already in place. It's like when you have in your house, you have different sockets in different parts of the house. You can plug iron in this pocket, you can, uh, in this socket, you can plug your TV in another socket. You can, so the foundation is already built for making fast, the vaccines faster. So any new vaccine that is coming out, it's gonna be much faster. Than, but then it does not mean that the issues of safety, the issue of efficacy have been uh, compromised. They're still there. So whether it was made fast or not, it, so long as you follow those basic rules about safety and efficacy, then it doesn't really, in fact, we should be happy. That, that, I mean, now you remember some of the points we were saying, with the very variant that is coming out in South Africa, the company is already beginning to make a vaccine against that variant. That is the speed things are doing. So people shouldn't talk about speed or something. The ambush should be looking at, at the conditions for safety and for, for efficacy. Have they been met? Full stop. Okay, uh, so this vaccine that we're talking about now, how long do you think it will last to protect us from contracting COVID again? If I take vaccine today, how long would it last in my system? Do I need to be taking it every year or every six months or so? I, I hope not, but none of us can tell you how long we treat because you can only say for those who receive it six months ago, they still have antibodies. So the longer we stay, the more we can say, for example, Yellow fever uh, vaccine. You know, there was a time when he said it's every 10 years you have to go back for it. That was based on years of experience of people who received the vaccine in the 1940s. You know, 40s to now, it's almost like uh, 70 years. And they've been able to show that over that period of time, you can retain the vaccine. I mean, your immunity goes down after 15, 10, 20 years. Even right now, the for yellow fever is like once you are immunized, you are, you are, you are protected for life. But then also remember that the fact that I have immunity now, if I have other debilitating disease, you know, my immunity will go down. So there's no hard and fast rule about that. So for this COVID, we can only say up to the length of we know about the people who have been vaccinated, it can last as long as two, two months, three months, or four months. So the longer we stay, before we can say with confidence how long it will last. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. I, I think uh, in the final part of the, I'm going to ask you to speak to Nigeria, especially those ones who still believe that COVID is not real, that it's a phantom uh, illness. I would like you to speak to those ones. And of course, to another category of people who believe that uh, vaccine is uh, designed to kill Africans so that their population can, uh, can come down because a lot of uh, um, stories uh, are going out, out there trying to debunk everything about COVID and vaccine. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, about whether the, vac the virus is a phantom or something, uh, I'm sure the, the one of each of us must have known somebody who died from the disease. Um, colleagues, friends, for them, for all those who believe that, my prayer is that you don't become the statistics we use for counting COVID cases in Nigeria. Worse still, you don't become the statistic for the dead people of, of COVID. And if they say there is prevention, wear your mask, please go ahead and wear it. And they also like we say, oh no, I'll get it, I'll recover. You don't have that guarantee. The people who died, they never knew they would die of it. So mm -hmm. please don't take the risk. It's unnecessary risk. Get your self protected. It doesn't cost you anything to wear your mask. In fact, it doesn't cost you anything to wash your hands. From the day when I was growing up, uh, we used to write to say something like, that was what we used to do when I was in primary school. Mm -hmm. That is cleanliness. You know, so why are we talking about washing hands as if it is a major issue? And when they say keep your safe distance, it's a simple thing. If somebody is sneezing next door on your face, you, you move away, won't you? I mean, you don't want anybody to spit saliva on your face. So move away. And part of this is that get that mask on your face. Even if you spit the saliva, it is your mask that will take it, not you. That's number one. Also, to, 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 to our colleagues who talk about, oh, vaccine, they are meant to depopulate. And I'm looking at the countries in the world that have the largest population and they are vaccinating their people. China. China has mm -hmm. more people than, I think they're, they're almost getting to 2 billion now. And they are vaccinating their people. So do they want to reduce their population? India is next. And in fact, India is the, is the vaccine production one of the world. So do they want to reduce their population? And then back to what I said earlier on, if these people had wanted to kill us and depopulate us, they would have done it a long time ago. Every drug, how many, how many drugs do we produce in Africa? Virtually everything comes from outside of Africa every vaccine, every vaccine. So they would have killed us a long time ago. It is not the, I mean, they have even more potent vaccines that can be used to kill, that the more diseases that can be used to kill. You know, so why would they want to use this one? That, that's the first, sometimes, like I said, people should reason that, you know, somebody has given you food before and then he's not bringing food for you today. No, he said he want to use that food to poison me. But you chop this food to grow to the age you are. So why will you now use that food now to poison and kill you? So these are some of the things I think we need our people not just to take stories as they are, you know, but to look at them and reason with them and say, look, could this be true? And again, let me also put it this way. It's a matter of, uh, of what is to make up your mind. They said, if you take this on, it will be protected. Mm -hmm. So why don't you want to be protected? And so you want to get this. And back again to say that, uh, all the other stories about vaccines and things, you know, and theories about that thing, they are simply not true. And again, I ask questions to people. Reason, when somebody tells you a story, you know, uh, if somebody looks and says fire is burning in your house, will you run away first? You look around whether there's fire burning at all before you start running. You know, those are the kind of things I think people should look at and say, look, you know, is this story true? And don't look at the person, I mean, not, not, don't, don't, don't take it because X has said it. Verify it from that person, I mean, about that person. I, I've given the example, if a religious pastor comes and starts talking about immunology, I will ask him, what does he know about it? That's not his area. If a carpenter comes to want to repair my car, I will obviously won't listen to him. These are some of the things I think people need to know. Prof, you just ended your meeting uh, the board meeting of bio vaccine uh, not long ago today. I would like to, on this uh, final note, tell us what is the mandate of the bio vaccine now? Has everything changed now? 
what is going to be different from the way you approach uh, or you handle a vaccine issue than before? The basic mandate of, of, uh, of uh, biovaccine remains produce safe and effective local vaccines. I mean, vaccines locally in Nigeria. That's the foundation of their vaccine. What COVID has done is to accelerate the pace that we are doing it. So there's an emergency in our hand now. Uh, you know, what do you need to do? So that foundation must be laid. And the while we are also are taking time to address the emergency. I, I had once we said, Bill Gates said, we should focus on um, PHC or whatever and, and not buying vaccines. In a way, I disagree with him. In a, you have a house in which the window pane is broken and then suddenly the roof is burning. Which one will you do? Will you go and repair your window pane while the house is burning? No, you focus on the house is burning. When you take care of that, then you can go back to your window pane. And that's why, in a way, I cannot disagree with the Bill Gates on that. That there's an emergency in our hand. We take care of that while I'm not forgetting that we have a major problem. And in fact, we use that emergency to rebuild a foundation where it has been rickety. Uh, on this note, uh, Dr. Mori, thank you very much. We thank you for giving us uh, time to talk to Ross, talk to Nigerians tonight. And uh, we're very grateful that at a short notice we contacted you, you responded, even though you have a very, very tight schedule. We thank you so much, Prof. And it's we do pleasure. hope that when next we call you, you always oblige us. I will always do. Thank you very much. You are nice. Thank people. you very much, like Prof. And have doing. a good night. And safe trip back much. to your place. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Nice, sir.